Hi folks, welcome to this chapter which serves as a little bit of an introduction to the handling of intercompany profits on the uh, intercompany sale of land and inventory. So I thought this might be a good opportunity to do a little bit of an introductory video to kind of set the stage so that you know the kinds of concepts you're going to run into, what the rules are for handling those things, the intercompany profits, and uh, then how to do some calculations that kind of permeate this chapter and the next chapter that also deals with intercompany sales. But let's begin. As I said, this chapter is going to deal primarily with the intercompany transactions. And again, when we say intercompany, we mean that the transactions are between two related parties, a parent and a sub, for land and inventory. So some of the key points you have to remember is number one, when you have an intercompany inventory sale, it doesn't matter if it's sold from parent to sub or sub to parent, the consolidated entity can only recognize its share of the profit that's charged to the related party when the goods have been sold outside of the consolidated entity to third parties. So again, if the parent, say for example, is selling some inventory to the sub, we're assuming that the parent has jacked up that price. They've charged a profit on that. That profit that the parents booked in its separate entity statements cannot be booked by the consolidated entity until the sub unloads it or sells it outside to a third party. Okay, so what that means to us is that when we're calculating consolidated net income, we're going to have to adjust the parent's income um, uh, to exclude any profit that it's booked on any inventory that the sub bought from the parent if the sub, again, hasn't been able to sell it outside to a third party right and the reason and we recognize that profit so when do i guess the question then becomes when can we recognize the profit the consolidated entity that is when it's sold outside to the third party which is usually in the next or following year so that's why i say here um usually that meaning the sale to the third party is in the next year because inventories occur an asset we normally assume it is any of these questions are assuming inventories occur an asset all right now, what about land? Land is different because land is non-current. So normally what you're going to find in these questions is say one entity, say it's the parent, sells land to the sub. And say the parent charges a little bit of a profit on that, right? That profit cannot be booked by the consolidated entity until the sub sells it outside. But because it's a, a non-current asset, it might be the sub's intention of keeping it within the consolidated entity for quite some time to come. So the only time that the consolidated entity can book any of that, uh, or can book any of that uh, profit on the land sale is when the sub sells it outside. So what you're going to find is that it may not be the case that in the following year, okay, after the intercompany sale of land has taken place, that you can recognize any of that intercompany, say, profit that was charged by the parent to the sub on the intercompany land sale. So it doesn't work like inventory because it's a non-current asset. So with those concepts, oh, I guess one thing I should say too, and I, I find that when I do this course in the classroom, sometimes this is confusing to students. I think by now you probably got it, but just in case not, I always look at this in terms of three entities, a parent, a sub, and a consolidated entity. The consolidated entity has the combined figures, the combined income statement and balance sheet amounts for the uh, uh, parent and the sub combined. And all we're doing here is we are adjusting any of those items in the preparation of our consolidated statements for profits that can or cannot be recognized this year. That's kind of the focus in our chapter here. All right. So now I've pulled a little example and maybe we can go through the example that kind of demonstrates these concepts. So for example, let's assume that on December 31st, year five, we have a company L and it is the parent and it purchased 70% of the outstanding common shares of Bo, the sub. They bought it for $5.6 million in cash when Bo's equity consisted of $2 million worth of common and $6 million in retained earnings. So that was their 
equity position, $8 million was the sub's equity position at the date they became related. Now here's the key. There is no acquisition differential. So what does that mean? If there's no acquisition differential, there's no goodwill. Because remember, goodwill is basically unallocated acquisition differential, right? So again, there's no goodwill. If there's no fair value, if there's no acquisition differential, right, it can't be allocated to any fair value increments or decrements, so we assume there's none of those either. So this question is a good one because it's strictly spotlighting how we handle intercompany transactions. We handled uh, fair value increments and decrements when we had an acquisition differential and goodwill impairment pretty much when we did chapter five. It will come back in, in, in this chapter as well. Um, uh, when we handle intercompany land and uh, inventory sales, as well as subsequent chapters when we deal with intercompany um, uh, sales of depreciable fixed assets. But for now, we're just spotlighting what happens when you have intercompany land and inventory sales. So we don't have to worry about any other adjustments to income. So now let's have a look. Now we're down the road. Now we're uh, a few years down the road at the end of year 10 and we have the separate entity income statements of L, the parent, and Bo, the sub. And you can see they're condensed. And at the end of year 10, we also have condensed balance sheets. So they don't outline all the current assets, but we know that inventory would be in there. We've got other non-current assets, which would probably presumably be our fixed assets, but we're not as concerned about them right now from a balance sheet perspective because there's nothing intercompany going on there. And then we've got our liabilities and equity, and you can see both companies at the end of year 10 are in a balanced position. So now, let's look at the additional information and see how we'll handle it. With the additional information, it says here that in the current year, year 10, the parent sold merchandise to Bo, the sub, okay, for 600000 However, 75% of that merchandise, or $450,000 worth of the stuff that the sub bought, hasn't been sold outside yet. It's still sitting in their inventory. Now, the issue with that is that 75% of what they haven't sold of the $600,000 that they paid to buy the inventory, 75% that they haven't sold is pack and profit. How do we know? because it says that L earns a gross margin of 30% on its intercompany sales. So 30% of the 75% of the, this 600,000, that's your profit, right? Now, that's in their ending inventory because it's a during year 10 item, right? Now, it also said that on December 31st, year nine, which was an intercompany sale that happened in the previous year, the inventory of Bo, which is the sub, contained 100,000 of merchandise purchased from the parent, L. Here's what, where the difference is. In year nine, when that intercompany sale happened, what did you do? Well, the parent, rightly so, separate entity, booked that profit. But the consolidated entity didn't because the sub, Bo, hadn't yet sold it outside. That's why we said at the end of year nine, it still sits there. That 100,000 is the amount of inventory that they bought right? The dollar value of what they paid for the inventory that they hadn't yet unloaded outside to third parties as at the end of year nine. So that's going to be coming into income this year, okay, consolidated income as profit. Now, in the earlier part of the question, when we talked about the year 10 sale from the parent to the sub, because the sub has not been able to unload 75% of $600,000 of the material stuff that they bought, right? Then we have to calculate what is the profit sitting in the inventory that the sub has that the consolidated entity can't take into net income. So in other words, from the previous year's sale in year nine, I always say to students, we have profit that's being shifted into year 10 from year nine and profit based on a year 10 sale that has to be removed from separate entity profit. So I talk in terms of this concept of profit shifting, which means any unrecognized profit from year nine, unrecognized by the consolidated entity, that can now be recognized in year 10, because by the time we get to the end of year 10, we assume the sub sold it outside, because don't forget it's current. But any intercompany sale that took place in year 10, if we know, as we do in this question, that the sub hasn't been able to unload it all, 
then what do we know? We know that there's some profit that's being packed in that inventory that hasn't yet been sold by the sub that has to be removed from our calculation of consolidated net income. That's one thing. Now, to further complicate your life, they now add a land sale that happened in year eight. That's when the parent or the sub sold land to L, the parent. So now we've got what I would call a downstream sale, a sale from the sub to the parent. And that's for 1.2 million. But Bo, the sub, when they bought the land in year six, they paid 1.1 million for it. So what happened is that they jacked up the price by 100,000 to the parent. And now the parent has not yet unloaded the land as at the end of year 10. So here's the issue here. Don't forget the um, sub, Bo, booked 100,000. In, in pre-tax profit, right, when they sold it, when they sold this uh, land to uh, its parent L, right? So now what we've got is in year 9 and now in year 10, we see that that land has not been yet sold outside. The consolidated entity cannot book into its income any after-tax profit on that $100,000 because it hasn't yet been sold outside. So here's a, si a situation where you're now going to have to remove profit, right? But don't forget, where did that profit get booked? When Bo sold it to L, so when sub sold to parent in year eight, that year eight profit on that intercompany land sale got closed out to retained earnings. And that's where it sits. So in this question, we're also going to ask you to do, as you can kind of see down here, if you, if you have a pop down here, it says we're going to ask you to calculate consolidated retained earnings at the end of year 10, right? That intercompany land sale is going to have an impact not on income in year 10, because don't forget the income was booked and the profit closed out in year eight by the sub. Right? So we're not going to adjust anybody's income. We would if in year 10 the parent had sold it outside. Then we would be recognizing profit from the consolidated entity perspective, right? Separate entities already booked it. Subs already booked the profit. But the consolidated entity won't book it until it's sold outside. But this, the question says it hasn't been sold outside yet. So the consolidated entity won't book the profit, but what will we do? We'll have to adjust it out of the sub's retained earnings because we can't recognize it there yet. So our consolidated retained earnings calculation is going to change for year 10 by adjusting the sub's post-acquisition retained earnings by the amount of the profit that by the amount of the profit that they booked in year eight that the consolidated entity cannot yet recognize in its retained earnings right? So it may sound a little bit confusing, but when you think about it and see the math behind it, I think you'll get it, all right? Now we also know that in year 10, the sub or the parent declared and paid dividends of 2.6 million and Bo declared and paid dividends of 800,000. Bo being the sub, don't forget you own 70%, so 560,000 is an intercompany dividend. We dealt with these in a previous chapter, so you should know how to handle those when you're calculating your uh, intercompany amounts. Right? Now it says that the parent accounts for investment on the cost method, and you'll notice throughout the book, they do talk about the equity method, and we'll do a little bit of work in this later on. But mostly, most companies account for their investments on the cost basis, right? Equity method hasn't been as popular yet here in Canada, but that could be changing shortly, okay? But for now, uh, you'll notice that most of these questions deal with the cost method. And then it says companies pay tax at a rate of 40%. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prepare a consolidated income statement and calculate consolidated retained earnings income for year 10, consolidated retained earnings at the end of year 10. And let's show some supporting calculations. I notice sometimes in the assignments, the students just prepare, prepare the answer and they don't show me any work. Make sure you show me all your work because I can't give you partial credit. If it's wrong, you'll get zero, right? But I want to be able to give you some part marks. So make sure you show supporting calculations. Now, how are we going to approach this? I'm not going to, calc I'm not going to uh, prepare the consolidated income statement yet. I'm going to do two things first. You'll notice your text does it as well. We do an intercompany profit analysis. So what I want to do 
is first I'm going to calculate the intercompany profits so I know exactly how much on an after-tax basis to adjust income um, and any uh, retained earnings and I'll get to th that in a minute but let's just make sure that we understand what we're adjusting and why so now if we have a look here we know if we go back to the additional information that on December 31st year 9 the inventory of Bo, the sub, contained merchandise that it purchased from L, and that contained $100,000 worth of um, merchandise, right? And we know that on that, 30% uh, is gross profit. So that was the merchandise. So on a pre-tax basis, all right, if 30% of that $100,000, right, is uh uh, pre-tax profit right so that's 30,000 remember I said I'm doing an intercompany profit analysis and what I mean by that I'm looking to see how much I'm going to adjust income by all right so now when I'm looking at this I know that I have pre-tax profit of 30,000 now that was at the end of year 9 but it's going to be recognized in year 10 so I'm going to be bringing into income, consolidated income, pre-tax profit of 30000 Whoever's booking that profit is also going to book income tax, or not whoever, but the consolidated entity is also going to recognize 12000 or 40% of it in tax, so that in an after-tax basis, the consolidated entity will, will recognize 18000 in profit coming into consolidated income this year. With the ending inventory, it's going to be reversed because 75% of this $600,000 worth of merchandise that the sub bought from the parent, it didn't sell. So if I'm calculating the amount of profit that's on this merchandise that they didn't sell, that's $135,000 in pre-tax profit, right? That pre-tax profit has to be removed when I calculate consolidated income. And when I say remove, I'm not saying to literally remove it from the separate entity that actually booked it. What I'm saying is I'm going to remove it in my calculation of consolidated net income. Because what I like to do with students is I like them to do a check figure so that they know exactly how much they should be adjusting consolidated income for so that when they get to do the consolidated income statement, they can see if the figures match. All right, so that's what we're going to do. So all I'm saying here is that on this 135,000 of pre-tax income that's been booked by the parent, 54,000 is what they booked in tax, which is fine. All right, but they um, uh, recognized on an after-tax basis 81,000 in their after-tax income. Fine, separate entity, but the consolidated entity can't recognize it this year. So we have to remove that from P's income, not literally, just figuratively, so we can do the calculation of consolidated net income and get that check figure I was talking about earlier. Similarly with the gain on the land sale, that happened when? That happened in uh, a previous year. So if we go back here, we know that the land sale happened in year eight, right? the intercompany land sale, but they purchased the land in year six. So the idea was here that the gain on the land sale that was booked was 100000 But what we're saying is that because the land still sits within the consolidated entity and hasn't been sold outside to a third party, we have to make sure that now we don't adjust income because now we're several years down the road. We're at the end of year 10. We can go in and adjust downward the subs retained earnings by 60000 because, again, we can't book that into consolidated retained earnings until it's been sold outside by the parent, all right, to a third party. So the best way, I think, to look at it, all right, is to maybe to, to have a look uh, with some of these things on what the entries might look like on the consolidation worksheet. You know earlier we were trying to show you what some of the worksheet entries would be um, if the parent was, was keeping a worksheet uh, to help them prepare their consolidated statements. So let's just have a quick look at that 
uh, in, uh, so that we can uh, see how all of this information in this table kind of fits into adjusting the different accounts that we're going to adjust when we prepare the consolidated income statement. So now what I want to look at is I want to look first of all at the beginning inventory item here. So what we said is that when um, with the inventory, with the parent selling to the sub, right? In the beginning inventory, at the beginning of year 10, were any of the profits, pre-tax profits, sitting in the sub's opening inventory, right? Now those profits can be recognized in year 10 by the consolidated entity. So what would things look like on the worksheet if we were preparing entries? And again, don't forget, they don't get posted anywhere on any separate entities books, right? They don't get posted in the separate entities books. They get posted in the consolidation worksheet to facilitate the consolidation. Well, what I would do here is I would say, well, we've already said, if you go back to the problem, that we have beginning inventory, we have 30,000 of pre-tax income that we have to recognize in consolidated income. We have tax that the consolidated entity will now book on, on its third set of books, right, of 12,000, and we would have to show an after-tax profit, 18,000. So what would it look like? Well, don't forget, the profit, after-tax profit, was initially booked, was initially booked by the seller, okay, the parent, for 18,000. I'm going to debit this opening balance of retained earnings by 18,000 because I want to shift that 18,000 at net into income. So you remember at net, we wanted to shift this into after tax income, right? In the current year. So how do we do it? Well, I already know that if I'm going to book 30,000 in pre-tax income into income consolidation uh, consolidation wise, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm just going to adjust my consolidated cost of goods sold figure for 30,000. I'm going to reduce it. When I reduce cost of goods sold, I increase pre-tax income, right? Because cost of goods sold is like any other expense. Reduce it, pre-tax income goes up. And that's what I want to do. I want it to go up by 30,000 and then I, the consolidated entity will book the tax expense. But that $18,000 adjustment has to come from somewhere. But don't forget, the parent initially booked it in its income, which got closed out to retained earnings at the end of year nine. So now what are we going to do? Now we said, well, we'll adjust the opening balance of retained earnings and we'll deal with that when we calculate the consolidated balance of, year, uh, of, of retained earnings. But the idea here is that now I just have to remember that the profit is going to be booked this year. And these two combinations here that I've highlighted at net give me an adjustment to consolidated profit going up by 18,000, if you think of it that way, right? Now, on the other hand, if I looked at the ending inventory here, I now have to remove 81,000 in profit, right? And after tax profit, and that also means removing pre-tax profit, and then also removing tax expense. Why? Because L, the parent, booked it in its consolidated, in its separate entity figures, this year in year 10, but the consolidated entity can't yet book it. So now what we need to do is we need to adjust it out of the year 10 calculation of consolidated net income. So how are we going to do that? Well, the way I do the entry for that is I would say, well, on the worksheet, again, it's not on any separate entities books, but on the worksheet, if I want to remove pre-tax profit due to an inventory transaction, I'm going to debit cost of goods sold. Increase in expense, decrease pre-tax profit. 135000 I got that right from here. 135000 which is the profit, 30%, on 75% of the goods that the sub bought, right? The sub hasn't yet unloaded it, but the parents booked the profit, right? So now I'm going to remove that pre-tax profit, and where was it sitting? It's sitting in inventory. So I'm going to remove it from my inventory and remove it from cost and, and put it into cost of goods sold or uh, adjust my cost of goods sold so that I can remove the profit, 
right? And then I also have to realize that if I'm removing profit of 135,000, then I also have to reduce my tax expense. When I say my tax expense, I'm talking about the consolidated entity, not any separate entity. So what would the consolidated entity do? The consolidated entity would set up a deferred tax amount. Think of the deferred tax amount as a prepaid tax. So in other words, if we think about it, your income tax expense from a consolidated perspective would come down, right? Because the consolidated entity isn't going to accept or, or take on any of that $135,000 in pre-tax profit. They'll, it'll be taken in once they sell it in, uh, in year 11. But we're not doing year 11, we're doing year 10. So what's going to happen is that if we're removing the pre-tax profit from income, we're reducing tax expense from a consolidated perspective, and the consolidated entity would recognize that the seller, the parent itself, has booked the tax expense, so they, consolidation-wise, would consider that to be prepaid tax, and we'll set that as a, up as a deferred tax amount. Okay? So now... If we go back, the last item we have to deal with is the land sale this year. So we'll deal with that now. So now, again, with the land sale, we know that at the time that the parent or the sub sold it to the parent, they booked, the sub booked 100000 in profit before tax. They actually closed out their year eight income for 60000 That's what they closed out on an after-tax basis, right, their profit they closed out 60,000 in profit. That's fine for the sub separate entity, right? But the bottom line is the consolidated entity can't recognize it until the parent sells it outside. So what do we have to do? Well, on the consolidation worksheet, there would have been an entry made to remove this uh, pre-tax profit right and where is it sitting right now the land is sitting at 1.2 million on the parents book so that profit is sitting in the land right so what would we do well we would debit or credit the land for a hundred thousand because that's where the pre-tax profit is sitting again that's your 1.2 million less your 1.1 million right that extra amount sitting in the land so we would remove that right because again, that's profit that's sitting in land that the consolidated entity can't book. The true cost of this land to the consolidated entity is what the original buyer paid for it, right? Which is 1.1 million. It's not 1.2 million, but now it's sitting in the parents' books at 1.2 million. But we would say, well, the original, the, the the consolidated entity should be recognizing it at 1.1 million, because that was the price at which the original, um, the original entity, which was the the the, the sub, bought it for. 1.1 million. So that's the true cost of the land to the uh, consolidated entity. Let me see if I got these commas and everything right. There, that looks better. No, it doesn't. Another zero. There you go. So that's the idea. So that land's got 100,000 in profit in it, but the true cost to the consolidated entity is what the sub paid for it. Now, don't forget... On that 100000 at the date that intercompany sale took place, there was pre-tax profit that was booked of 60000 right? Because the tax rate was 40%. So the idea here is this. That profit of 60000 got closed out to the sub's retained earnings because they were the seller, right, uh, back in year eight. But because the consolidated entity can't recognize any of that profit yet, we have to back it out of the opening balance of retained earnings of the sub. And don't forget, the sub did pay tax on that 100000 that they booked. That's now that profit sitting in the land. So now we've got a deferred tax amount. So that deferred tax amount, it's deferred to the consolidated entity. The separate entity, we assume they paid the tax on it. But in this case, we have to set up a prepaid or a deferred tax from a consolidation perspective because they can't recognize any of that profit yet. Okay? So now, with that in mind... Let's go have a look at our calculation of consolidated net income, which is the second thing I recommend you do before you go ahead and do a consolidated income statement. So I'm going to pause and take a little break here, all right, and then I'm going to come back and we're going to work on uh, this calculation of consolidated net income and then put together the consolidated income statement as well as the uh, calculate consolidated retained earnings at the end of year 10.